In the tranquil suburb of Oakwood, a spacious house with an impeccably maintained garden stood out from the rest. It was the residence of Catherine Bennett, a sixty-year-old lady known in the neighborhood for her sweet kindness and her garden full of vibrant flowers. But the joy of colors in her garden contrasted with the sadness of the silence in her home. John and Lily, her children, had moved away years ago, and the visits that used to be frequent became rare and eventually ceased. Sitting in the old armchair in the living room with a cup of tea in her hand, Catherine stared fixedly at the family portrait on the fireplace. The youthful smiles of John and Lily alongside Catherine's late husband seemed to belong to another life. John, Lily, where are you, my dear ones? Catherine whispered, her voice trembling, her eyes clouded with tears. A ringtone interrupted the silence. Catherine answered, hoping it was one of her children. Mom, it's me, John, the voice on the other end of the phone announced, and the relief in Catherine's voice was palpable. Oh, John. It's been so long since I heard your voice. We've missed you, Mom, John replied with a rehearsed tone. Lily and I have been thinking we need to spend more time with you. We're considering a visit. What do you think? Catherine felt a flicker of joy. Oh, that would be wonderful, my dear. I can't wait. As she hung up the phone, Catherine's smile brightened the room. She had no idea that phone call would be the beginning of a series of events that would change her life forever. On a cold, dark autumn night, the headlights of a car illuminated the entrance to Catherine's house. John and Lily, both wearing concerned expressions, stepped out of the vehicle and walked up to the front door. Lily, the younger of the two, with perfectly applied makeup to hide the marks of time, looked at John with a doubtful expression. Do you think she'll believe us? She whispered nervously. John, older and with deep lines of worry on his face, looked at Lily, his gaze stern yet determined. She has to believe us, Lily. We have no other choice. They knocked on the door and were greeted by Catherine's radiant smile. John. Lily, she exclaimed, embracing both warmly. Come in, I've prepared dinner. During dinner, John and Lily filled the old house with laughter and stories of their lives in the big city. They talked about their jobs, friends, and even the difficulties they were facing. But they left out the crucial part of their lives, their desperate financial situation. In the following days, John and Lily's visits became frequent. They helped Catherine with household chores, brought gifts, and made all kinds of gestures that fueled Catherine's hope of having her children back. Mom, John began one evening, Lily and I have been talking. We miss you, and we think you miss us too. How about selling this house and coming to live with us in the city? Catherine, surprised by the suggestion, looked at her children, tears of joy welling up in her eyes. She could hardly believe what she was hearing. The possibility of living with her children again was all she wanted. However, she had no idea that her dreams were about to turn into a nightmare. For days, Catherine pondered over John and Lily's proposal. She loved her house, but the idea of living with her children, seeing their faces every day, and sharing their lives filled her with emotion. Finally, one night, she made a decision. John, Lily, I've thought a lot about what you said, Catherine began, her voice trembling. And I've decided. I've decided to sell the house and come live with you. The siblings exchanged furtive glances, their faces masking the satisfaction they felt. Oh, Mom, we're so happy. Lily exclaimed, getting up to hug Catherine. You'll love the city, I'm sure. With the decision made, things moved quickly. The house was put up for sale, and, to Catherine's surprise, 
it sold in no time. She found herself surrounded by boxes, her belongings being packed for the move. While packing her photo albums, Catherine felt a twinge of sadness bidding farewell to the house that had been her home for so many years. I'm going to miss this place, she said softly, caressing the frame of an old photograph. Don't worry, Mom, John said, putting a comforting arm around her shoulders. You'll love the city. And most importantly, we'll all be together. At that moment, Catherine didn't notice the complicit look exchanged between John and Lily. She was far from imagining the true intention behind their comforting words. The big move finally happened. Catherine, with a mix of excitement and nervousness, said goodbye to her house and the neighborhood she loved so much. John and Lily welcomed her into their car and took her to the big city. Hey, Mom, you'll love the view from our apartment, Lily said, trying to lighten the heavy atmosphere. And the parks, the shops, everything will be new and exciting. Upon arrival at their destination, Catherine was met not with a cozy apartment, but with the entrance of a large nursing home for the elderly, the walls painted in pastel colors, the gardens well-maintained. John, Lily, there must be some mistake, Catherine said, confused. This is a nursing home. Mom, we're so sorry for not being honest from the beginning, John began, his voice trembling, avoiding her gaze. We can't support another person in our apartment anymore. And with the money from selling your house, we were able to secure a safe and comfortable stay for you here. Catherine felt her heart tighten. She looked at Lily, hoping to see some sign that this was just a tasteless joke, but Lily's face was serious, her eyes filled with tears. Mom, we're so sorry, Lily said, tears streaming down her face. We promise we'll visit you whenever we can. And so Catherine found herself alone, abandoned at the entrance of the nursing home. She felt a deep sadness, a sense of betrayal that left her bewildered. With tears streaming down her face, she entered the new place that would be her home, unaware that this sad twist in her life was about to give way to surprising new beginnings. Life in a nursing home was a big change for Catherine. She missed the freedom of her own house, the familiarity of her garden, and above all, the hope of being with her children again. But she was a woman of strong spirit and decided to face the situation head-on. One afternoon, while sitting in the nursing home garden, Catherine saw an old house for sale across the street. Something about that house caught her attention. It seemed lonely, just like her. Remembering her hidden savings, Catherine decided to buy the house. When she shared the news with her children, they laughed, doubting Catherine's ability to take care of an old and unused house. But Catherine was determined. I am stronger than you think, Catherine said, looking into John and Lily's eyes. And this will be my home. On moving day, Catherine found herself once again surrounded by boxes but this time there was a sense of anticipation and hope. Shortly after moving in, Catherine met her neighbors, a young couple with four-year-old twins. Camilla and Martin were kind and offered help with the necessary repairs in the house. Ms. Catherine, this house needs a little touch of love, Martin said, looking at the weathered house. And I think we can help you with that. And so, a new friendship blossomed. Even in the midst of a challenging situation, Catherine found herself surrounded by people who genuinely cared for her. It was a twist she didn't expect, but deeply appreciated. The following months were a whirlwind of activity. Camilla and Martin, along with their adorable twins Julia and Max, helped Catherine transform the old house into a home. They painted walls, repaired the roof, and tidied up the garden. Catherine, despite her age, was determined to assist in every way she could. Mrs. Catherine, you need to rest, 
Camilla scolded as Catherine insisted on helping plant flowers in the garden. My dear, I've never felt so alive, Catherine replied, her face radiating joy. The old house began to come back to life. The walls received new colors, the garden blossomed, and the house, once so lonely, was now filled with laughter and conversation. John and Lily, observing from a distance, couldn't believe the transformation. They never expected Catherine to be capable of such a feat their surprise, however, turned into anger and resentment. They felt deceived, believing that Catherine had hidden money from them. Mom, you really surprised us, John said during a visit, his voice filled with false joy. Yes, Mom, you really showed us how independent you are, Lily added, her smile not reaching her eyes. But Catherine, happy in her new life and oblivious to her children's feelings, just smiled and thanked them, unaware of the storm brewing. Life in the old house was just beginning, and with it, new surprises were waiting. With the house finally in order, Catherine began exploring every corner, every room, getting to know all the secrets of the place. One afternoon, while descending the creaky stairs to the basement, Catherine noticed something peculiar. The basement was damp and dark, filled with old boxes and dusty furniture. In one corner, there was a large, old, locked chest. Catherine's curiosity was immediately piqued. Camilla, noticing Catherine's excitement, suggested, Maybe Martin can open the chest for you, Mrs. Catherine. With Martin's help, the chest was opened, revealing a stunning collection of jewels and gold, each piece more dazzling than the last. Catherine was shocked, hardly able to believe the fortune. She had discovered treasure in her own house. It's incredible, Mrs. Catherine. Martin exclaimed, his eyes wide with astonishment. You are a lucky woman. Catherine, however, was stunned. She decided to keep the discovery a secret, sharing it only with her lawyer, who advised her to keep the valuables safe until she decided what to do with them. Throughout the days, Catherine pondered her basement discovery. The wealth she had found would change anyone's life, but for Catherine, the real value lay in the friendship she had found with Camilla, Martin, and their twins. No amount of money could buy what they had shared. With this realization, Catherine began to consider a plan, one that would turn the lives of everyone around her upside down. Years passed, and Catherine became an integral part of Camilla and Martin's family. The twins, Julia and Max, regarded Catherine as a grandmother, running to her with school stories and seeking advice. Catherine, in turn, delighted in their presence, her smile always brighter when she was with them. But the passage of time also brought challenges. Catherine's health began to decline, and old age proved to be a formidable opponent. Nevertheless, she refused to be defeated always finding joy in the little things. Catherine, you need to take care of yourself, Camilla would warn, concerned for her friend. And I am, dear, I am, Catherine would respond with a smile. I am surrounded by people I love, and that's all that matters. Life continued, filled with laughter and memories. The family Catherine found in Camilla, Martin, and their children was a gift she never expected but was infinitely grateful for. Meanwhile, John and Lily remained obsessed with their mother's wealth, convinced that she was hiding a fortune. They made plans to ensure that this wealth would end up in their hands, unaware of the treasure Catherine had discovered in the basement. Then, on a cold winter night, Catherine, sitting in her favorite armchair gazing at the flickering fireplace, made a decision. She called her lawyer and began planning her will. The choices she made that night would be the final and most surprising chapter of her life. Catherine's health continued to deteriorate over the months. Although sadness hung over the house, 
Catherine insisted on maintaining her smile, cheering up Julia and Max with her stories and assuring Camilla and Martin that she was okay. You are the family I've chosen, she would say, holding their hands, and I couldn't be more grateful. One day, when John and Lily came to visit, the tension was palpable. They noticed their mother's frailty, and although they were emotionally distant, the reality of the situation hit them like a gut punch. The Last Days Mom, you should be in a hospital, John said, trying to keep his voice steady. Lily nodded, avoiding her mother's gaze. No, my dear, Catherine replied, looking at them with tired yet determined eyes. This is my home, and it's where I want to spend my last days. John and Lily's visit was brief and awkward. When they left, a strange calm settled over the house. Catherine looked at them through the window, an unmistakable sadness in her eyes. I hope they find happiness someday, she whispered to herself. They deserve it despite everything. That would be Catherine's final encounter with her children. She somehow knew that time was running out, but she wasn't afraid. She had her family, Camilla, Martin, Julia, and Max, and she had her final plan, a plan that would bring justice and balance to everyone. The end came gently for Catherine. On a cold winter morning, she took her last breath with Camilla holding her hand. The loss was felt by everyone in the neighborhood. The kind lady who had brought so much warmth to their lives was gone. I promise to take care of everything, Catherine, Camilla murmured, feeling a mixture of sadness and determination. Rest in peace. John and Lily received the news with a strange mix of sadness and relief, sadness for the loss of their mother, relief for the prospect of the inheritance they believed was theirs. The community came out in full force for Catherine's funeral. Camilla and Martin, alongside Julia and Max, received condolences from friends and neighbors, all bringing stories of how Catherine had touched their lives. At the end of the funeral, a serious-looking lawyer approached the family. I am David Lesh, Mrs. Catherine's attorney, he said, handing them sealed envelopes. She requested these to be delivered after the funeral. There will be a reading of the will next week. Everyone's eyes widened at the mention of the will. Camilla and Martin looked at each other, while John and Lily could hardly hide their anticipation. Thank you, Mr. Lesh, Camilla said, accepting the envelopes with a nod. And so, with Catherine's passing, a new series of events was set in motion. Catherine's final move was just beginning to unfold, promising to shock everyone with its final revelations. In the days following the funeral, Camilla and Martin, along with Julia and Max, reminisced about their memories of Catherine. The house felt empty without her presence, every corner reminding them of the love and warmth she had brought into their lives. The sealed envelope that David Lesh had handed to them sat on the dining table, a constant reminder of Catherine's final message. Finally, one evening, Camilla decided to open it. Dear family, the letter began, written with Catherine's shaky handwriting. If you are reading this, then I have already departed. But don't be sad. The will. Remember the laughter, the stories, and the shared meals. That is what truly matters, Catherine continued in the letter, expressing her love for all of them and how grateful she was to have them in her life. At the end, there was a reference to the will, as for the will, you will find out everything during the reading, she wrote. But know that I tried to do what I believe is fair. And Martin, you were my salvation and family when I needed it the most. Julia and Max, you were the joy that brightened my last years. The family finished reading the letter, their eyes filled with tears. Catherine's love for them was evident in every word. But what did she mean by what I believe is fair? The day of the will reading was approaching. Curiosity hung in the air, 
but so did a sense of apprehension. Catherine's final wishes were about to be revealed, and no one could predict what would come next. The office of esteemed lawyer David Lesh was filled with people on that particularly hot summer afternoon. Tall, expansive windows allowed golden rays of sunlight to bathe the room, casting long shadows on the polished wooden floor. Camilla and Martin, John and Lily, along with a few other community members who considered themselves close enough to Catherine to be present, were seated in leather chairs that creaked at the slightest shift in weight. The hum of the air conditioner was the only audible sound, a tense symphony of expectation hanging in the air thick like fog. At the center of the room, David Lesh stood behind a dark mahogany desk, sunlight reflecting off its polished surface and accentuating the grave expression on his face. He picked up the thick envelope, Catherine's will, and everyone held their breath, waiting for him to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, David Lesh began, his voice filling the room, echoing off the stone walls. I am here to perform a duty of utmost importance and sensitivity, to read the last will and testament of our esteemed Catherine Bennett. He paused, looked at everyone present, and continued, if you are ready. There was palpable tension in the room as David Lesh began reading the document in his hand. The words were clear, unequivocal. To Camilla and Martin Robinson, I leave my residence and all my personal belongings, David Lesh read aloud. Whispers of surprise run through the room, some looks of shock and disbelief directed towards Camilla and Martin, but no one was truly prepared for the bombshell that would be the next revelation. As for my accumulated fortune in jewelry, gold, and diamonds, David Lesh continued, pausing for dramatic effect before announcing, with a monetary value equivalent to several million dollars. The room erupted in hushed whispers, the previous tension evaporating and being replaced by palpable shock. And so, Catherine Bennett's final wishes began to change the course of everyone's lives in that room. Exactly half of my fortune, David Lesh's voice echoed through the room, adding weight to the following words, shall be generously donated to the Pine Grove Elderly Home, the place where, under different circumstances, I would have spent my last days. John and Lily swallowed hard, each word of their mother's will undoing the premise of an easy inheritance and carefree life. Looks of surprise and disbelief were exchanged, while Camilla and Martin shared glances, nodding in silent understanding of Catherine's intentions. David Lesh continued, this time with a trace of hesitation in his voice. And the other half of my fortune, he paused for dramatic effect, his eyes sweeping the stunned faces in the room, shall be designated for Camilla and Martin's children, the young Julia and Max. The silence that followed was almost deafening. The air was charged with surprise and shocking disbelief. John and Lily seemed to have lost all color, their dreams of quick wealth crumbling like a house of cards. Camilla and Martin, on the other hand, looked at each other, their eyes wide with incredulity as they tried to grasp the magnitude of Catherine's generosity. In the end, David Lesh concluded the reading, choosing his words carefully. Catherine had left a final message for her biological children, John and Lily. He paused, taking a deep breath before continuing, I hope you find the happiness you seek. And remember, money is not the source of joy. True joy comes from the people we love and how we treat others. As for my money, you have already had your portion from the sale of the house, in a situation where I felt deceived and practically coerced. You won't see another cent. The room immediately turned into a whirlwind of conflicting emotions. John and Lily, with expressions of anger and frustration, stormed out of the room, the echoes of their departure still lingering in the air. Camilla and Martin were practically immobile, struggling to process Catherine's unexpected generosity. One thing, however, was clear, Catherine's final wish had turned everything upside down and nothing would ever be the same again. John and Lily were furious. 
How dare Catherine leave the majority of the fortune to strangers and to an elderly home, they fumed. They considered themselves her children, regardless of how they had treated her in recent years. This isn't fair, John lamented to Lily as they settled into the car after the will reading. We are her children. We'll contest the will. That money should be ours. We'll contest the will, said John, his eyes gleaming with determination. She was senile. She didn't know what she was doing. Meanwhile, Camilla and Martin were in a state of shock. They had never expected to receive anything from Catherine, let alone a house and a fortune for their children. We can't accept this, Martin said, visibly shaken. She was our friend, not our benefactor. I agree, Camilla said. Martin replied, holding her hand, but maybe we can use this fortune to do something good, as Catherine would have wanted. As the storm brewed, Catherine's final will set the town into a frenzy. The following weeks promised to be filled with tension as the apparent heirs prepared for a battle that could change their lives forever. John and Lily sought out the best lawyer's money could buy, attempting to contest Catherine's will. She was senile. Her mind wasn't clear when she made this will, argued John in court. On the other hand, Camilla and Martin, along with lawyer David Lesh, were ready to defend Catherine's will. Your Honor, Catherine Bennett was fully aware of her actions. This entire claim is just an act of greed, David Lesh argued. The courtroom sessions were intense. Testimonies were heard, evidence was presented, and nerves ran high. Finally, the judge delivered the verdict. After considering all the evidence and testimonies, it is clear that Catherine Bennett was in full possession of her mental faculties when drafting her will. The attempt to contest it is therefore rejected. Silence fell in the courtroom as the decision was announced. John and Lily were shocked, while Camilla and Martin felt a mixture of relief and sadness. They knew that this fortune represented the last tangible reminder of their dear friend Catherine. It's not over, John snarled at Camilla and Martin as he left the courtroom. I'll take this to the Court of Appeals. Camilla simply nodded, holding Martin's hand. They knew there was still a long road ahead, but for now, justice had prevailed. Catherine's will would be fulfilled as she had wished. Despite their threats, John and Lily never managed to take the case to the Court of Appeals. The defeat in the local court had depleted their resources, and the realization that their greed had led them to lose the last connection with their mother hit them hard. They retreated from the town, fading into the shadows of their own lives. Camilla and Martin, on the other hand, dedicated themselves to honoring Catherine's legacy in the most meaningful way possible. They invested their children's inheritance in education and established a fund for scholarships for underprivileged children in the town. Catherine's house was renovated, becoming not only a home for the family but a symbol of Catherine's love and generosity. I don't know if we deserve all of this, Martin said one evening, watching their children play in the backyard. It's not about deserving, Camilla replied, pulling him close. It's about what we do with it. Catherine gave us a chance to make a difference, and that's what we're going to do. In the end, Catherine Bennett's story served as a reminder to the entire community, true wealth doesn't come from material possessions, but from the love and kindness we share with others. Her memory continued to live on, not only in the beautifully restored house or the scholarships granted, but in the hearts of those she touched with her generosity and love.